Today's seminar is presented by Dr. Matthias Hegel, who's joining us from Guillaumar in Kiel, Germany. And he'll be speaking with us about impacts of deep seabed mining, results from independent scientific monitoring. Uh, and I don't want to take any time away from Matthias's uh, time to present by giving his list of accomplishments and where he has studied. Um, but I'm so thankful that he is sharing his knowledge with us today. So Matthias, I'm going to stop sharing and turn it over to you. Yeah, thanks a lot, Beth, for the invitation and the opportunity to present um, the work that we've been doing the last seven years on, on this topic. So I'll try to share now. Good. I hope you can all see it. <clears throat> um, um, we, yes, now it's in the correct view. Go ahead. Yeah, it always takes some time. <laughs> <clears throat> yeah, so um, this is a um, European-wide project called Mining Impact, um, and it started in 2015 and uh, has been running basically until the end of this year, and we're, we're hoping to get uh, a third phase of the project um, going next year, or this year, maybe even, um, and it's funded through um, at JPI Oceans, with the, which is um, not the European uh, Commission funded, uh, but by um, individual countries and states in the in the European Union, um, and um, you always need to get at least three countries interested, and it, it's then paid mainly through the ministries of research of different countries. Um, and you can see in the acknowledgement down there who, who is funding. Um, mining impact. Um, in this second phase that, that has just ended, uh, we have been 30 partner institutions um, from nine European countries. So quite a large project with also some considerable budget uh, because deep sea research is quite expensive. And um, I will show you um, a few examples um, on or highlights maybe um, on what we have uh, found out so far um, in terms of impacts um, and what we have been doing particularly um, the last um, four years. Um, but as a little intro, because some of you may not be so familiar with this topic of deep sea mining, the, the main question <clears throat> uh, basically, or the interest from, from industry um, and, and different countries around the world in, in deep sea mining basically comes from the question, where do we get our metals in the future um, when we want to do um, the energy transition from fossil fuels to uh, renewable energy, solar energy, wind power uh, plants, because um, that there is a higher demand than in the next um, decades um, in terms of metals and uh, the graph on the um, right hand side shows this um, uh, projection from the World Bank. So um, they believe that just for the energy uh, technologies, uh, the, the demand in lithium and cobalt, for example, will increase by something like almost 400 to 500 percent um, from, from what it is now in total. Um, nickel will also be 100 percent of of all the nickel demand we have so far, which is not just for, for, for energy technologies, um, and also an increased um, demand in molybdenum and, and zinc and, and other metals. And the question is, um, can land-based mining still fulfill this, this demand? Um, so at the moment, there's only a very small area in total of land that is mined for these metals, but it's Hard, more and more harder to get to them. Um, and some of the, the minerals that we have on the deep seabed actually have higher concentrations of these metals um, compared to any of the land um, reservoirs. Just as an overview, what we're talking about when we're talking about marine mineral resources <clears throat> in the deep sea, um, these are the three main ones. One can also talk about phosphorides, but for the metals, it's these three. It's the polymetallic nodules that we find in abyssal plains. So at water depths, somewhere around 3,000 to 6,000 meter depth. The three main metals um, 
um, of interest for the energy transition is are nickel, cobalt, and copper. Um, manganese in the economic models that, that the uh, industry is um, looking at at the moment would also be needed to be sold um, from it. And then there are trace, um, more trace elements like lithium, molybdenum, titanium, and rare earth elements um, also um, in there. And in total, these metals of interest make up about 3% of the nodule, three weight percent. Um, the second mineral um, are ferromanganese um, cobalt rich crusts, which um, you can find at different seamounts. Um, and here on, on the world maps, um, I always show in, in orange colors um, where they are known to be found already. <clears throat> there are certainly also other areas in the world that haven't been uh, explored so far at all. Um, so any of these metals we may also find somewhere else than uh, you can see on this map right now. And the third one um, are then massive sulfides, which are basically um, old extinct hydrothermal vents. So they, um, you can find them on, on mid-ocean ridges. Um, and in green, I've shown on these maps um, the locations where the International Seabed Authority or also some countries have already issued um, exploration licenses. So at the moment, there is no exploitation happening in the world. Um, and <clears throat> the International Seabed Authority is in charge um, of administering um, these metal, uh, these resources um, in the area, which is the seabed area outside of any exclusive economic zones of countries. Um, in mining impact, we have focused um, on polymetallic nodule mining um, in these last um, seven years or eight years almost now, uh, because um, technology um, and prototypes are more developed for this um, type of resource, while for massive sulfides and cobalt rich crust, there are some ideas or drawings, but there hasn't been built any machine or, or demonstrator or, or prototype so far. Um, in Germany, um, in marine research in Germany, we've already looked in, into these impacts um, some 20, 25 years ago. Um, and the drawing on the left-hand side is actually from, from this older project um, where I actually started as a PhD student in. Um, and so I, I have been working on this topic for quite a while now. Um, what we expect, um, and what we also saw during uh, the tests um, of the first industrial machines um, two years ago is that um, with um, nodule mining, um, not just the nodules are removed from the seafloor, but also the entire bioactive um, layer, which is typically on global average in the deep sea, the top five to 10 centimeters of sediment where all the higher organisms live in. Um, for economic reasons, the contractors uh, themselves and the industry are always talking about mining um, of two to three million tons per year and operation. And um, in this Clare and Clipperton zone where, um, where the ISA has issued um, exploration contracts, um, the nodule density on the seafloor um, would then translate into mining areas of 200 to 300 square kilometers per year per operation. Um, just as an example, it's not a familiar city to people in the US or so or around the world, but Munich uh, in Germany, which is a mid-sized uh, town, um, has a, an area of about 200 square kilometers. So something like a mid-sized town uh, area would be mined um, every year for each operation of, of mining of not polymetallic nodules. Um, so in these areas, the surface area with the fauna will be removed completely. In addition, as a second impact, um, <clears throat> sediment will be suspended just by the machine driving over the seafloor and picking up the nodules. Um, and then also the nodules are typically um, pumped up or will be pumped up through a riser system to a surface platform where, where they will be further cleaned 
Um, and since uh, this is additional weight and costs, um, um, it is expected that uh, this wastewater sediment um, return water will be injected again um, into the uh, water column. And there have been or and there are still discussions um, where they should um, return this wastewater plume. Um, the trial that the metals company has done in November last year, so a couple of months ago, um, they actually re-injected it in about 1,200 meter water depth, so mid-water. Um, in this German research project, we have also already looked in, into that 25 years ago. Um, and our suggestion was actually to return it down to the sea floor um, to keep the um, uh, dispersal of, of the sediment plume as small as possible. And this, this is also what we would still recommend today with uh, the additional information that we have. <clears throat> Um, and, and these, these uh, impacts um, that you see here will lead to a loss of habitat, loss of species and genetic diversity, loss of ecosystem structure and functions, and um, the seabed characteristics will be changed and with it also the processes in the seabed. And so the, the, the overarching question um, that we as a society in the end have to answer if we want um, to engage in deep sea mining is, how much of these damages to the marine ecosystem are acceptable to us? What, what did we learn about the deep sea ecosystem, the benthic ecosystem? So we, we also didn't look too much into the water column yet. This is something we want to do in the third phase of the project um, when we get the funding. Um, so we focused on, on benthic ecosystems, so the seafloor area. And what we basically learned is that the nodule ecosystems um, are very unique. Um, they support a very high diverse fauna of sessile and mobile species. And you can see a few examples here of sessile species. So sponges, sea anemones, um, corals, mobile species, typical ones are holothurians. So sea cucumbers, um, you have some jellyfish then many different kinds of worms. Um, and the interesting thing is um, that the sessile fauna, particularly the stalked sponges that are attached to, to the nodules um, and can't grow in the soft sediment, actually form a specific habitat also for mobile fauna like ophioroids um, or isopods and so on. So it's, it's really a specific habitat. And I will show a few examples more what that actually means compared to soft sediment fauna abundances later on. Um, the fauna communities um, and with it also the environmental variables um, of different kinds show a very high variability even on, on very local small spatial scales. So not just over tens, hundreds, um, thousands of kilometers, but also already on uh, distances of uh, a couple of tens of meters. And then the big, still the big unknown after all these years of deep sea science, um, particularly all the data from, from, from the CCZ, um, from contractors and so on, um, is species connectivity. We know that species, are, that some species are connected, um, and related to each other across the clearing Clipperton zone or even across the entire Pacific. But we have uh, little understanding on uh, how on, on which time scales this is happening on which spatial intermediate scales. So in order to understand um, a little bit more um, on the longer term impacts, um, we looked at in the first phase of the project um, in at old uh, benthic impact experiments um, that had been done in the clearing Clipperton zone, but also in the Peru basin south of the equator um, and the Pacific um, in the 90s um, and uh, end of the 80s already. Um, and I show here a couple of examples. So in 2015, <clears throat> when the project started, we had two expeditions. One looking at different old benthic impact experiment sites um, in the clearing Clipperton zone, and one looking at the, the discall experiment that German marine scientists had uh, done um, in 1989 already. 
Um, in the disk call area, we have different kinds of stretch tracks or EBS tracks, um, or in the um, in, uh, with done with a sled or so. Uh, and you can see here down in the uh, left hand corner an example from a stretch track that uh, Omco um, did um, already. Um, nowadays, now it's already forty two years ago. Um, and it actually looks like like it had been drawn yesterday. Um, this track, for example, we find in the French um, um, exploration license area. And um, here for comparison um, from the Belgian area, um, a dredge track that when we visited was uh, uh, drawn uh, a year uh, before we actually went there. And I, 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 I like to show this picture because it also shows nicely and illustrates what we expect, what deep sea mining vehicles, when they collect the nodules and, and this bioactive surface layer uh, will uh, leave in the end. So you see the nodules are a two-dimensional resource um, and the bioturbated layer is here completely removed with a stretch and um, exposed is a sediment um, that is at least 20 to 30,000 years old and also a bit more compacted. And is, um, has, is, has less organic carbon in it and um, less microbial um, abundance uh, than the, this bioactive surface layer. And there are no higher organisms um, living in the sediment anymore. Um, and on the right hand side, you see um, the experiment that um, the discal experiment um, there, um, a plow harrow. Um, that was welded together on board of, of the Zone uh, research vessel was drawn 78 times um, across a circular area, so that in the end you have areas that are more disturbed than, um, for example, these outer regions here. And um, in the lower right corner, you see a, a photograph from an ROV um, that we took in 2015, so 26 years later, and uh, you can nicely see that it looks like, like it has been done yesterday. So as an example on, on the impacts um, of these disturbances on benthic ecosystems from the Clare and Clipperton zone uh, benthic impact experiment sites, um, a graph on um, the epifauna, so the larger fauna on the left-hand side, the sessile fauna, uh, like uh, crinoids or um, little corals um, and so on, uh, sponges. And on the uh, right-hand side, you see the associated mobile fauna in these areas. So holothurians, ophiuroids, uh, echinoderms, uh, and so on. And you can nicely see um, in these areas with nodules, you have higher abundances um, of the sessile fauna, but also of the mobile fauna compared to the areas with no nodules in these exploration contract areas um, in the vicinity. So it, it is this specific habitat that is formed um, by the nodules itself that has higher abundances of, of epifauna compared to the soft sediment that we typically find in, in um, where the, where the nodules uh, haven't been grown. And then in these disturbed areas, the picture um, looks like this. So of course, since the nodules have been removed, um, there is little to no sessile fauna um, that is to be expected. But we also see um, basically the similar picture for the mobile fauna. Um, and that up to even four, four decades after um, these disturbances uh, were introduced to the seafloor. So over several decades, there is basically no recolonization happening. And that, that is what we, what we um, need to remember when we think about deep sea mining. So the direct impact removing the nodules and this bioactive surface layer um, will not um, lead to uh, there's no we don't expect recolonization happening over on decades scales. This will take many many times longer. What we also saw um, in these disturbed areas is that not just the total abundance was reduced, but we also saw uh, a change in um, in community composition. So more from suspension feeders towards um, the tritivores and predators. 
And then we also, of course, were, were asking ourselves what happens to the biogeochemical processes um, that are mediated by microbes? How do the microbes cope with these disturbances? Um, and here you see a heat map um, of that um, where we, we actually looked at uh, different um, sites and locations of different disturbance intensity. Um, so high disturbance intensity in yellow colors and in reddish colors, uh, sorry, um, low, dis, low dis, um, 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 <clears throat> impacts um, in, in uh, yellow colors and in red, um, high disturbance levels. Um, and we can nicely see that um, the basic uh, biogeochemical functions like organic matter degradation or respiration, um, microbial secondary production are uh, highly impacted even uh, in this case, um, three decades um, after the impact was drawn. And based on, on something like microbial uh, growth, um, we can actually estimate that um, these organic matter degradation um, <clears throat> rates from uh, mediated by the microbes will need at least five to six decades um, to go back to normal conditions in this area. And this is from the discal area. <clears throat> and since this is the, the basic um, of the basis of the ecosystem um, that um, produces or, or um, generates the, the, the nutrients for the higher ecosystems and trophic levels, um, <clears throat> we, we can expect that the impacts take um, several hundreds to probably even thousands of years. And we've shown that with biogeochemical modeling um, already that, that it will take these long time scales. And the reason is that the food, the flux of food, so organic carbon into the deep sea um, is so low. And so the responses of the ecosystem to any kind of impacts will also be very, very slow. Um, in the second phase of the project, um, we had the chance to um, accompany uh, the first industrial uh, trial of, of a nodule collector system that was conducted by GSR, a, a Belgian contractor. Um, and so this machine, this prototype machine of a nodule collector system was tested in 2021. Um, you can see a few people running around there or sitting on top of it. So even this prototype, which is roughly one to four, the size of what the actual machine is supposed to look like, um, <clears throat> has already dimensions of five meter height, eight meter length, and about five meter um, uh, width, and uh, in water weighs 19 tons. So it's already quite a big machine, but remember it's one to four to what GSR wants to build um, for the real purpose of mining. The machine was uh, tested uh, in the uh, BGR claim, so from, from the German Geological Survey um, and from GSR. And um, so this, these both areas lie in the um, um, western, uh, in the eastern part of the Clarion Clipperton zone. Um, and that's where, where we um, had the chance to go with a second vessel um, in parallel and do investigations. But we already started our investigations um, uh, two years or almost three years before um, in 2019, because um, there we actually already conducted baseline uh, studies um, of the trial sites and um, a reference site um, next or in close vicinity um, to the trial site. Then uh, in 2021, we accompanied the trial, trying to um, actually measure and determine the spread and distribution of the um, sediment um, cloud uh, into the water column and the resettling on, onto the seafloor. Um, and just before Christmas this year, um, we went there a year and a half later to continue the monitoring um, and look at um, how the impact evolved um, in the trial sites. And we also revisited, of course, the reference sites to see what the natural um, temporal variability or changes are. Because you always have to compare <clears throat> the impacts um, to also the natural variability, of course. And we hope to, in the third phase of the project, to return maybe after four or five years after the trial. 
the two sites were uh, also picked because um, this gives us the opportunity to uh, look at the impacts um, at uh, different conditions. Um, so the faunal compositions, abundances are different, um, and also the biogeochemical processes are, are different in terms of rates because we're slightly, they differ slightly um, by, by the surface productivity regimes that you can actually see here in this colored um, background colors that you see on this map. This is not the bathymetry. This is the POC flux um, from the surface uh, onto the seafloor. So there is a little bit more organic carbon reaching um, the areas in the German claim uh, compared to the Belgian one. And this, of, for example, already translates into different um, uh, depths of uh, oxygen penetration into the sediment. <clears throat> so this is the layout um, of the uh, baseline and the um, post-impact studies that we did. Um, and this was driven um, by uh, plume dispersion modeling that we actually did um, at the before we went out there and, um, in 2019, uh, because we needed, of course, to understand um, where the sediment plume may go um, that is um, produced by the machine. Um, and to pick a reference site um, that um, is hopefully not impacted by the sediment cloud. And here um, you see a map um, in the lower in, in the upper right area um, of uh, probability scenarios based um, on um, oceanographic modeling of current data from the month of April over a succession of uh, eight years from 2010 to 2018. Um, and we did these kind of modeling for the Belgian area and also for the German area. So you can see that the modeling um, based on, on this current data that is available um, predicted that there would be a preferential uh, direction from uh, to the south east um, where the plume would go. The two areas, as I already said, are slightly different um, from the productivity regions. And this is also translated into the uh, organic carbon um, liability uh, at the seafloor in the sediments. Here you see, as an example, the phytopigments. Um, so in the German area, the amount of phytopigments is um, larger than in the Belgian area. And the error bars show you the um, spatial variability from sample to sample that we encounter, which is also quite large, as you, as you can see. Um, then in this graph, you see the benthic oxygen consumption. Um, you can see that the trial and the reference sites were picked quite nicely. They are quite similar in the German and, and also in the Belgian area, and the two sites differ quite significantly from each other. And here you see on the, on the uh, right-hand side, uh, you see the oxygen depth profiles that we measured with um, in-situ profilers um, in these different locations. So as you can see, there is already a high spatial variability um, within and also between the sites. The, the, diff, the, the uh, distance between both sites, the German and the Belgian one, um, is about um, 500 nautical miles. Um, whereas the reference and um, trial sites within each area uh, have a distance of about eight kilometers. <clears throat> um, here, as an example, um, the uh, benthic communities in terms of macrofauna um, taken with box cores, and you can see again trial and reference sites were picked quite quite okay. They are quite similar, and there is a significant difference between the Belgian and the German area. Um, but here on, on the right-hand side, I show the individual results from each box core deployment that we had. And we had six to seven replicates in each of the, of the sites. And you can see the spatial variability. And this is then on something like 200 meter uh, scale um, is actually very large. And this complicates in the end the impact assessment because you need a lot of replicates to actually get a robust um, information on, on this um, small scale spatial variability. 
Um, now a few slides on the sediment plume and how we try to measure it. Um, so this shows the layout plan um, from sampling, uh, coring with box cores and multi-cores, um, ROV push cores, but also the layout of our uh, sensor platforms with which we tried to quantify the sediment concentrations um, with on spatial scale, but also over time. So we deployed about 50 different acoustic and optical sensors on 20 platforms. So we always had two to four um, sensors on one platform. Um, and before we went out um, in 2021, but also afterwards, we intercalibrated uh, all these 50 sensors so that we actually can compare their readings with each other as well. <clears throat> And so we, we did not just qualitatively try to, uh, to determine that sediment, a sediment plume is passing, but we, we now have a quantitative information. We know exactly how much, how many grams or milligrams per liter um, uh, in the water column pass the sensors at which distance. And this, this also helped us to understand a little bit better which of the, um, of the sensors is uh, more suitable for this kind of monitoring of the sediment plume concentrations than others. <clears throat> um, here you see a few um, photos um, from the trial areas um, and um, in the Belgian area, we, um, uh, the collector drove uh, or collected nodules uh, in an area of 37,000 square meters and the German area was a little bit smaller, only 22,000 square meters. Um, and um, here you can see basically the caterpillar tracks um, that uh, Patania 2, the collector prototype left on the seafloor. The nodules have been completely removed and um, here we actually measure the oxygen profile, um, depth profiles with a microprofiler um, after the collector has driven and removed the sediments and the sea floor, surface sea floor. Um, here you see the plume coming by while we were trying to sample areas next to the uh, mined areas about 50 meters away, uh, where you can already see on this photo that uh, sediment plume had res has resettled um, and blanketed uh, the seafloor and, and its uh, fauna. Um, the plume actually, um, that's also what the sensor readings told us, um, didn't went much higher than uh, five to 10 meters above seafloor. So uh, stayed closer to the seafloor than we had originally expected. Um, the reason is that these high sediment concentrations um, in, the, in the plume actually create something like a density current, um, which doesn't mix very much with uh, the bottom waters and the currents. <clears throat> Overall, in these mining mined areas, about four to eight centimeters of surface sediment uh, layer was removed. And um, in the vicinity up to something like a hundred meter distance, about two to three centimeters um, of sediment were uh, redeposited um, on the seafloor afterwards. Um, and you can map this um, impact area of the mind area quite nicely. Um, for example, with this um, AUV uh, backscatter map. Um, so you can see the darker brownish um, areas here. That's where the collector uh, drove um, since during this trial, the collector didn't have a riser system, so it didn't pump up the nodules. Um, a big basket bin uh, at the back of the machine had to be emptied every 50 to 60 meters um, so that we have now stacks of um, nodules lying on the seafloor. And th these are the, the black uh, reflections that you can see here on, on the graph, uh, on this photo. Um, since most of the sediments, about 90, 95% of the sediment has actually resettled within a distance um, of one to almost two kilometers um, uh, away from, from the mined area. Um, but there, there is a remaining um, low concentration sediment cloud that doesn't resettle, at least not on the time scales of, of a couple of weeks. Um, and um, we actually, uh, so, uh, could show that this um, 
this um, sediment plume, low concentration sediment plume actually also left our survey area. So it was transported more than four to five kilometers away from, from the mine site. And this is all also already in, in good agreement with, with the studies that, that uh, German colleagues had done um, in the 90s um, from the Discol experiment site. <clears throat> so in, in addition, and I just want to quickly highlight the right-hand side of this graph, uh, we also were able with um, DGTs, um, so diffusive gradient uh, fin films, we were able to uh, determine that in the sediment plume, there is a release um, of metals like copper, manganese, uh, and cobalt, um, which is above background. So the, the red dotted line here is the background concentration um, in, in the area. Um, <clears throat> so despite the fact that it's oxic metals, we do see a release um, of dissolved uh, metals uh, into the water column. Now, just um, as a visualization, uh, we also put um, cameras down onto the seafloor, and here you can see a picture before the trial was happening. This is about 100 meters away from the mining site. The camera took photos every five minutes. Um, I will not show the, the entire movie from it, uh, but just uh, two or three um, photos. Um, so when the sediment plume passed for seven hours, the vision was like this. You can't see anything. Um, and then afterwards, it looked like a snow-covered landscape, basically. Um, and if, if you look, then some of the uh, fauna, like some sea stars, were able to dig themselves out and crawled away. Um, here, a sea urchin is coming, and uh, which is a predator, and, and looking for, for dead animals. Um, but here, the sponge, for example, uh, is not able to clean itself, so it... it stays with the sediment cover. And the question is, will it survive this impact? <clears throat> so um, from, from the, the latest cruise uh, before Christmas, of course, I can't show any data. Um, but uh, we did, of course, um, already analyze the data from the previous cruises from 2019 and 2021. And here you can see the pre-impact um, data. Um, on, on this side, and then in the mined area, the abundance of macrofauna in this case, we see similar pictures for, for megafauna and myofauna, um, is of course reduced because this bioactive surface layer is completely removed. And then what is quite interesting is that in this thick sediment cover, so where we have two to three centimeters de deposition, we actually saw a higher um, abundance of uh, macro and myofauna, and also organic carbon. And the question is, so it's probably because um, all the, the fauna that was resuspended into the sediment plume um, resettled as, as larger particles basically relatively quickly um, behind the collector system again. Um, and the question is now, is this fauna still alive? Did it, did it survive uh, this getting sucked into the machine and um, ejected at the back? Um, or um, is it a dead fauna? Because with the tools that we have, we were not able to um, analyze this. Because whenever you get the sample up onto the deck of a ship, the animal is dead anyways because of the depressurization. So this will be interesting to see now in the new data um, if we see changes there because of microbial degradation of dead animals or if, if these higher abundances um, have remained. So that, that's what we want to illustrate with this graph here. So what is what are the longer term um, effects um, in the collector trials um, tracks? Is there a possibility of recolonization and how much um, of the biota did survive this redeposition? Um, the only hard data that we ha actually have so far in terms of threshold values comes from an experiment that we did in 2015 um, in situ, um, where we um, um, suspended sediment and then um, measured the uh, nematode abundances um, in uh, box core samples, uh, in, in push core samples 
afterwards. And um, there we, we actually, the colleagues from University of Ghent actually saw that there is a higher mortality um, in, uh, of nematodes um, when, when they uh, were actually uh, covered with additional sediment of more than a half a centimeter to a centimeter thick, as you can see in this graph. So this is at the moment still our only really hard threshold value of for an impact that we um, that we already have, um, and we're we're working hard now um, on getting more of these kind of re really discrete uh, threshold values um, quantified. If we use this kind of um, one centimeter as a threshold value for increased nematode mortality. Um, with the numerical plume modeling, we can actually determine, um, for example, for the tr Patania trial, um, um, what the uh, impact area will look like. So the mind area in the German area was only 22,000 square meters. Um, and based on, on the information that we have from the sensor data that um, we tried to match with uh, numerical this numerical plume modeling, we actually can quantify that uh, for nematodes, the area where, where a redeposition of sediment is, uh, is about one centimeter, um, is an area of 122 square meters, a thousand square meters. So about six times larger than the mined area. And <clears throat> this kind of, of uh, modeling together with, with the information that we have on impact uh, will hopefully help um, to, um, determine a little bit better operational plans to minimize impact. So to um, uh, basically answer questions where to put um, uh, conservation areas into the license areas that are not mined, how far do they need to be away um, from, from mining areas. So spatial planning, um, we hope to, to get in, um, um, a contribution with our results in, into this, how, how should deep sea mining, if, if it takes place, um, be uh, operated. Um, one additional <clears throat> uh, thing that I wanted to show is um, in, um, impact from acoustic noise from, from the machine and the mining operations. Um, so this is actually the first data that, that was ever measured. Um, on it. So we, we also put uh, four hydrophones out um, in both areas. Um, and you can see the data from one of the hydrophones uh, here. Um, the main noise that we actually recorded um, was uh, below 10 hertz. Um, and we can show that this is uh, coming from vibrations of the seafloor that um, the collector uh, introduced. So we can, I think, expect that uh, benthic fauna um, may be impacted by these vibrations. Um, the, at higher frequencies, we measured up to 2000 Hertz. Um, the frequencies of the noise was completely um, uh, basically overtuned by uh, the ship noise uh, from the surface, ship surface platform. So, um, this this is an impact that that of course will also increase um, with deep sea mining more ship traffic and also uh, of course the uh, ship on the surface um, from which the collector system uh, will be deployed. Um, but this should be relatively easy then to to be scaled up to industrial operations of something like three hundred to three hundred fifty uh, day operations per year. What we also started was a recolonization experiment. <clears throat> the colleagues from NEOS uh, put out more than 100 of these frames with um, artificial um, nodules um, and also some artificial stalk sponges on it. Um, and we will see, or maybe we, we will not see in the next years, uh, but the next generation of deep sea scientists may revisit those sites and uh, maybe they can see already some recolonization of a coral or a small sponge. Um, uh, what we do hope to see maybe in the next uh, years is that um, a microbial biofilm may grow around these nodules. So we will hopefully go back. We already collected a couple of these nodules on, on the cruise before Christmas. 
Um, and we hope to go back in a couple of years and continue this, um, um, this study and experiment. Yeah, and all these informations, we try to, um, to transfer basically into recommendations for ISAS mining code. Um, and um, with this, um, I would like to stop because um, I've probably already talked too much and too long and um, I'm open to questions. Thank you so much, Matthias, for sharing this uh, <clears throat> very exciting information with us.